So the third of our uh, eight-week or seven-week lecture series is great. Uh, we have two great speakers again here for us today. So as usual, at 7 o'clock, we're going to start with our, our research lecturer. So I want to introduce Jim Hood, who's a new tenure-track faculty member at Ohio State University. He's in uh, ecology, evolution, and organismal biology. Um, Jim's a recent hire. I think January is what, what we've said. He came in in January. So he's new in the lab. Those of you that are familiar with Ohio State and EEOB, Ecology, Evolution, and Organismal Biology, uh, Dr. Libby Marshall and Dr. Stu Ludson have a, a lab that's called the Aquatic Ecology Lab. And Jim's a member of that lab. Um, this has been a very successful lab for the university and did a lot of great work in it. Um, this is Jim's first time up to the island. So uh, when Jim came on, uh, he, he contacted Sea Grant and, and Stone Lab and wanted to know about our program. And, and we're hoping that we can get Jim up here to do a lot more research in the, in the upcoming year. Um, as usual, I, I'm going to ask Jim here to stand up and give a little bit of insight into his career. So, you know, what he thought about doing when he's a kid and how he ended up where he's at now. Um, but then he'll spend the bulk of his time really just talking, as you can see from here, um, towards understanding stream ecosystem responses to warming using natural geothermal laboratory. So if you guys could uh, join me in welcoming um, Jim Hood. Great. Uh, thanks a lot for having me here. This has really been a pleasure to come up here and see everything. Amazing research you guys are doing. So. Um, Chris asked me to talk about my background and how I got here. So I, uh, I don't know what I wanted to be as a kid, <laughs> um, but I know I, when I was in college, I was trying to sort of figure out what I like to do, and I knew I liked being outside, and I took this limnology course from Bart Stasio. So I went to Lawrence University, which is a small uh, liberal arts college in Wisconsin, and I took this course from, from Bart, and it really, like, it really got me excited. I started thinking about all the linkages between physical processes and links, and biological processes, and that got me excited. And Bart um, uh, gave me an RU position, and I eventually did a thesis. And I just realized that, wow, you know, this stuff is pretty cool. I like doing research. I like writing these papers. And so if I could do this for the rest of my life, that would be really great. And I did my RU at this, this uh, lake in northern Wisconsin at the, at the um, Trout Lake Station. And, uh, and I was like, oh, these people get to live on these beautiful lakes. And it just it seems really relaxed. So, like, this is the lifestyle. And so I was like, okay, that's great. So then I uh, went to Miami to do a master's. And I did that on uh, the role of fish in nutrient cycles. So basically, that's fish pee. Um, and then I was a technician for a couple of years in Minnesota. And then did a PhD in Minnesota working on um, basically the feeding ecology of, of caddisflies and daphnia and how nutrient comes, nutrients flow through the earth. And then I went on, I got a, I finished that, and I went on and did this postdoc at Montana State University. So that was for this stuff. Um, looking, at, We're using this geothermal uh, watershed in Iceland to understand how temperature influences stuff in rivers and, and how that, you know, to help us understand what's going to happen in terms of so I did that for a couple of years. Um, postdoc funding for that ran out, and uh, was employed for a while, and then got my own money, <laughs> uh, my own grant, and then we got a second round of funding for this. And then uh, just last January, I started at OSU. So uh, that's the past. Um, very complicated. So today I'm going to talk about the stuff we're doing in Iceland, and. I've gone through that. Basically, we have this geothermal watershed that we're using to sort of understand how climate change is going to affect rivers. And so this is really, I've got a million co-authors down here, um, and this is a really collaborative project. So um, uh, Wyatt Cross, John Benstead, and Alex Huron uh, at Montana and the University of Alabama were the, were the original uh, PIs on the first grant that I was a postdoc on. Jill Watson has since joined us, and she really focused, she's really interested in end fixation and nitrogen cycling. And then we have uh, Jan Olsen over here and Giesli, Gieslison, um, Icelandic colleagues who have been working in these systems for, for decades, and you know, we're really sort of riding their coattails. And then millions of graduate students and undergraduate students. So this is really, the work I'm talking about is very collaborative, and it's everybody's work. So we all know that um, global air surface temperatures have been rising over the last 50 or 100 years. And, you 
know, we, so we see it in surface air temperatures. We also see it in streams and rivers and lakes. So this data from uh, Kushal et al. shows annual mean temperature in streams and, and rivers, so real rivers, streams. And we, we see sort of a similar rise in air temperatures in aquatic bodies that we do in air temperature, although the, the mechanisms aren't clean. And if, furthermore, you know, models project that we're going to see anywhere between two and eight degrees of warming by 2100, depending on how much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases we do into the atmosphere. So this poses a really uh, a big challenge for ecologists, right? We need to understand how um, warming and other aspects of global change are going to influence the ecosystem and, and, you know, be able to understand those changes and potentially help mitigate the, the response and help species. And so, how do we do that? And there's a lot of different approaches, but one potentially promising approach is to look at the direct effects of, of temperature on organisms and scale those direct effects up. And so this idea is focused on, so we've known for, for basically 100 years that the rate of enzyme activity here increases with temperature exponentially to some sort of optimum and then declines as, as the uh, enzymes become inefficient and denature. And recent work by Brown and Galuli and West you know, under the sort of umbrella of metabolic scaling has shown that, that we can take these, if we know the uh, temperature dependencies, so the slope of rate limiting enzymes in, in different cellular processes, that we can scale those up and make predictions at the whole individual level. So this is called an Arrhenius plot. It's mass, uh, the natural log of mass corrected metabolic rate versus inverse temperature. So warm is over here, cold is over here. You'll see a bunch of these. So this means that, that mass corrected metabolic rate increases with temperature. And what you'll see here is that the, they've plotted uh, metabolic rate for plants and for fish. And so plants and fish have very different respiration rates, even after you correct the body size. But they have different intercepts. But the slopes are all, same, all the same. And so what that's telling us is that the temperature dependency of respiration is constant across all of these organisms. And Brown and Galuli and West and people who have been developing metabolic theory have, can, are able to link these temperature dependencies back to enzymes that are involved in, in respiration. So this is a potentially really powerful tool. You can, you can predict how the energy demand of an organism is going to increase with, with increasing temperature. And, and further work has shown that not only can you scale from enzymes to individuals, but you can scale all the way up to ecosystems and make predictions about how carbon flux at the ecosystem scale is, is changing with temperature. So this shows respiration at the ecosystem scale versus inverse temperature. So you have predictable temperature dependencies at all these scales. And so this is a really, really powerful tool. And so I'm just going to illustrate this with gross power production, or ER, or respiration. So this is the, the expectation for gross power production and at the ecosystem level and ecosystem respiration, ER, at the ecosystem level. So gross ecosystem respiration should have a steeper temperature dependency than uh, gross power production. It should be more responsive to an increase in temperature. So if we take a, a standard cold Icelandic stream and we warm it up 4 degrees, so the mean projection for 2100, we'd expect a 20% increase in GPP and a 40-some increase in respiration. So, so that tells us how much more production we're going to get. And it also tells us that there's potentially going to be this shift in the balance between production and respiration. At least in the short term, you predict that more respir respiration is increasing more rapidly than production. So this is a potentially really powerful tool. There have been a, a number of uh, meta-analyses that have, that have uh, gone out and looked at respiration rates and methane fluxes across ecosystems at different temperatures and have found um, activation energies or temperature dependencies that really generally support this theory. So that'd be great if that worked. And so what's this, but, but the world is a little more complex than that. So what, what this theory essentially assumes is that warming has an effect on an individual at the physiological level. And that effect sort of trickles down all the way to the ecosystem. But we know that, that, that it's, that's not the case, right? When you
when you warm things, we know that there are indirect effects of warming through feedbacks between individuals and populations, through the food web and through the ecosystems that might muddy these temperatures. We also know that different organisms have different thermal response curves. So this shows performance versus temperature for two different organisms, one that likes cold temperatures, another that likes warm temperatures. And you would assume that, that if temperature is warm, that this warm species would do best, right? So this would suggest that there's going to be community shifts. We know that those are happening. Um, and furthermore, terrestrial ecosystem experiments have shown, and these have been running for aquatic ecologists, Warming experiments by aquatic ecologists are way behind terrestrial ecologists because they've been doing experiments for decades. And that these experiments have shown several things. One, that, that there are large changes in community composition in response to this. And that there are changes in the way nutrient cycle and the nutrient requirements of a species. And that not only, not only there are these big changes that could potentially affect these predictions, but also what they see in the short term is not what they see in the long term. So in many warming experiments, initially you warm a plot of land and you'll get an increase in production. But over time, you'll get less production because of changes in the way nutrient cycle. So, so really an overarching goal of our work is to try to understand, you know, can we, can we develop a mechanistic framework for predicting responses to warming? And this could be an equation or it could be a more theoretical model, um, whatever, whatever your, your, your taste is. But that's the general goal. And now, for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to focus in on trying to predict um, gross power production, right? So I'm, we're, gonna, we're just going to focus on the gross power production data from Iceland and, and see if we can, we can build a model to, to predict that. And so what we're really asking is, can we predict production using these first principle frameworks, the metabolic theory? Or do we have to include other considerations, like how temperature influences species and their traits, how it influences resources, and potentially feedbacks and interactions between resources or different members of the community? So, so we've been lucky enough. I've been lucky enough to, to work in this uh, area in Iceland. It's um, the Hangeo region. It's about 45 minutes outside of Reykjavik, and so it's a geothermal field. Here, this shows uh, most of our sites. That's about two kilometers of river. And this shows uh, the stream annual stream temperature for all of the sites. Range, and they range from 6 degrees Celsius all the way up to 32 degrees Celsius on average. So we have this huge range in temperature. There's actually even hotter streams in here. There's a 50 degree one. But we have this huge range in temperature, but no large differences nutrient concentrations or other volume chemistry. So essentially what we have is this great natural laboratory, right? Big differences in temperature, small differences or so little differences in nutrient concentrations and other, other uh, volume chemistry. And so we've been, and this, so this makes us a great system, right? You can take your Iceland extreme, the six degrees Celsius, and you can look at it, and then you, you can go over, you know, to the next stream and go, like, okay, well, that's 10 degrees Celsius. That's what this Icelandic stream is, might look like, 21, you know, 2100. And we, the, our Icelandic colleagues have been studying these streams for a couple decades, and they've had essentially stable temperature regions. So, so we think, consider these as temperature acclimated. So this is a great laboratory for understanding this. And so we've been using a variety of approaches to understand how temperature might influence stuff in streams. Oh, sorry. So I just want to, we're, we're in an island in the middle of a lake. <laughs> so I wanted to take a second to, to, to remind you why streams are important. So, so one, they plumb the landscape, right? Aquatic systems, and streams and rivers in particular, remove a lot of carbon um, as, as, the, as the water transports down the landscape. Um, they also remove a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus. A lot of that activity is happening in small uh, headwater streams like the ones we're working in. And then also, um, you know, prime production in these rivers supports a rich invertebrate and fish community. So this is really what we're talking about here is the base of the food web, right? So we're trying to predict how production that fuels the rest of the food web in these systems uh, is going to respond to warming. So we're using a really 
explicitly multi-scaled approaches. And so what we're trying to trade off is this, there's this trade off, right, between when you're studying things between control and complexity, right? You can have a really complex whole ecosystem, right? But if you, but if you go out and study it, you can't really control and experimentally control it. Um, so there's this trade off here. And then we're also balancing this, this issue of the duration of warming. So these terrestrial experiments have shown us that responses in the short term may not be the same as what you see decades down the road. So we're trying to understand how that duration of warming influences things. So we've got three sets of experiments or measurements. We conducted a survey across this landscape of streams. I'll talk about that a little. We conducted a whole stream warming experiment where we warmed this cold Icelandic stream up by uh, almost four degrees. And then we have these microcosm experiments. So these are little three meter long channels uh, with one inch tiles in them. Um, where we can, we can really dial down and just control temperature and biofilm and understanding how those, that's in influencing production and nutrient cycling. So what I'm going to do today is I'll talk, uh, I'm going to focus on GPP and I'm going to talk about the microcosms, the ecosystem warming experiments, and the landscape survey. So the microcosm experiment, this was uh, Tanner Williamson's master's thesis. He was a student at Montana State University. He's now a PhD student at Miami University. So, so Tanner was out there in the rain uh, and the crime were rather running these and uh, really did a fantastic job. So these, in these experiments, we have 15 channels. They're about an inch wide, three meters long, and five treatments. So cold Icelandic stream water that was warmed up five degrees, 10 degrees, 15, and 20. And so we warmed this water using a heat exchanger system. The water was delivered uh, from a cold Icelandic stream, piped down the landscape to get enough, to get enough head, and that was run through these two heat exchangers here. So these are just, uh, that's PVC, they're about this tall, tall. This is PVC and these are metal tubes. So the water rushes through there and these, these uh, heat exchangers are placed in this warm pond. And then we have another heat exchanger that's placed in this hot pond. And here I'd just like to point out this guy here is Philip Johnson. He's a, a petroleum engineer, or was he retired now? He's a petroleum engineer at the University of Alabama. And so we brought him on to just help us figure out how to work. He, he, he was fantastic. You know, he'd sit down with an Excel spreadsheet and tell us if we have this much tubing, we're going to get this much warming. You're going to lose this much friction, head, and everything. It was, he was really great. So this never would have happened without him. So he really needs to be acknowledged. So in these experiments, we measured biomass of the biofilm growing on these little piles, growth power production, respiration. We measured all of that in these little chambers. So we take these tiles out of the channel, put them in the chambers for, for a little while, measure production and respiration using oxygen fluxes, we measured nitrogen fixation and nitrogen uptake too. So here's Joe Walter measuring end fixation. Um, and so because of Philip's efforts, we got a nice, variation in temperature. So this shows temperature over about a week in the middle of the experiment. Um, you can see there's a nice gap between all the treatments. And also that we maintain the natural diurnal variability, which we think is important for, for creating realistic temperature treatment. All right, so what do we see? Well, this is, this is, these are the tiles towards the end of the experiment. So you see you get a big increase in biomass from basically bare tile and your cold Icelandic stream water all the way up to just this big mat of stuff at 20 degrees Celsius. We're interested in our GPP fluxes. So let's look at that. This is another one of these Arrhenius plots. So this is natural log of GPP um, or respiration versus inverse temperature. So warm is over here. And here are our predictions, our theoretical predictions, right? Respiration is steeper than GPP. And this is what we saw. So the so theory did a really poor job here. Right? Um, this, is, this is actually, it did a really, so let's look at this another way. This is GPP. This is what we expected. This is the blue line that's probably from where you're standing doesn't even look like it's increasing. And that's what we observed. So over this first 10 degrees of warming, we expected a 60% uh, increase in gross power production, and we saw 2,000%. Right? So we, we totally missed the mark. And the question is why? And I think to answer that question, you can go back to these tiles 
and look at what's on them. And, and remember, I'll remind, I didn't say this, but these are strongly nitrogen limited materials, right? And so what you see as you look at this, as you warm these tiles, you start to get not cyanobacteria. So this is not stock, more not stock here. And this is just a big mat of anathena. So these are all N6 cyanobacteria. So lots of pictures in these channels. And it turns out if you plot N fixation on this, so this blue line is N fixation, N fixation has the same slope as prime of production and respiration. And the slope, we, the temperature dependency we see for N fixation isn't, is exactly what we expect, right? So N fixation uh, is energy intensive, and so it's really inhibited by cold temperatures. But as you warm things up, N fixation really kicks off. So it has a steep temperature dependency. And so what's happening here is if this is GPP versus inverse temperature, and you're starting here at your cold stream. As you warm it up a little bit, you get more end fixation. That's bringing more nitrogen into this end limited system. And you keep doing that as you go up, and that's creating this, this steep slope, right? So you're, as you warm these up, you get more end fixation. You relieve end limitation, and you get more gross carbon system. So this is why the theory isn't working. But it's also telling us something about the way temperature is influencing the nitrogen cycle. So, so this is nitrogen assimilation by the biofilm versus temperature. So here's ammonium uptake. So this is, this is uptake of nitrogen from the water column as it passes over the stream bed. And then that's end fixation. So both are increasing. But really what's happening here is in your cold stream, you get most of the nitrogen that's fueling the growth of these biofilms is coming from the water. And when you get up here to, this, to 25 degrees Celsius, the majority of nitrogen fueling the biofilm is coming from the So warming is really rerouting the nitrogen cycle. You're going from this cold community that's, the, that's fueled by dissolved and organic nitrogen to this warmed community that has tons of cyanobacteria, and, and it's the majority of the nitrogen is coming in from the atmosphere. So warming is really changing the way this is happening. And as a, as a result, it's basically, we come back to our predictions. This says that we can't predict how warming is going to influence gross carbon production without understanding how it's going to influence end fixation <coughs> and resource control. So, so let's go back to this, this idea of the model we're building. Um, it's promising, right? We, we can't use the first principles framework alone, but it says that we, if we can understand how warming influences nitrogen fixation and understand where and when it's important, then we can make predictions about uh, gross power production. So, so this, is, this is a pretty promising, you know, the first, first hypothesis didn't work, but we know enough information and now we can start to build models that, that help us predict the growth of So now we're going to scale up to the ecosystem level and see how those models do. So here we, uh, we use a before after control impact design. So we have an experimental reach, which is this little Icelandic stream here, and a reference reach, which was a nearby cold stream. And we sampled these streams for a year before warming and a year after warming, or two years after warming, actually, but I'm only showing the first year. And so on a monthly basis, we measured whole stream nitrogen and phosphorus uptake, whole stream metabolism, so gross farm production and respiration, and then the biomass and carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus content of the major organic matter. Um, so here's how we measure metabolism. So we use a, what's called a diel oxygen uh, two-station approach. So we have a, an oxygen sensor at the bottom of the river, an oxygen sensor at the top of the river, and we get these diel curves, right? So the blue line is at the top, green line is at the bottom. And you can see as the light comes on, as you get light, there's an increase in, in oxygen due to gross power production, and then a decrease when the light goes off. And so we can feed these into a model and essentially get gross power production and respiration out of the model. Um, so here's, this is how we warm the experiment. So this is our cold river here. Our experimental reach starts right about there. We spill up again, saving our, us from ourselves. Um, so what we did is we built a reservoir here at the top. We piped cold water down. We sent it through a heat exchanger that's submerged in this 22 degrees Celsius stream and then piped it down and back. So the water's warmed up without ever coming into contact with the, the heat source 
without using any electricity or natural gas. Um, yeah, that's the point I had to make. All right, so that's the summer. This is this is Iceland in the winter. So Lily, who's here, she's measuring nutrient uptake um, in the stream. Jim's helping her. Lily's about comes up to my nose. So three meters of snow. Um, here's here's Dan Nelson, a PhD student from Alabama who worked on the warming project, photographing our reference stream here. So we got really good at identifying, uh, you know, where our stream was and where exactly we were in the stream. So here's here's one of my proudest moments. I'm I'm like head down, weaseling through a basically two meters of snow to grab a DO probe. I got it on the first try. So there you go. I learned something with all this education. Um, and so we, you know, we, we use these big, uh, big trucks um, that have these enormous tires to basically get into these sites in the winter. Um, and we worked with a rescue squad from Quergerty, which is a nearby town. And so these, these people are fantastic, right? Instead of having a Coast Guard, there's all the people who rescue you with oceans or when you're camping or when you're on the road, all volunteers. And so they, they contacted with us and helped us basically get out to our sites with these enormous trucks when they weren't out saving people's lives. Um, they were doing that for a long time until this happened. So we found, these things are amazing. I mean, they just float over snow, right? But we found this uh, inside stream, got stuck in here in the middle of a blizzard, and uh, didn't, we ended up walking after that. All right, so here's the temperature time series from uh, from the warming experiment. So this is the experimental stream. Before, it was about 5.8 degrees Celsius on average. Warmed it up to about 9.7. Maintained a lot of the natural diel variability, again, thanks to Philip. And then here's, here's the temperature anomaly. So that takes into account what's going on in the reference stream. So everything I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about in this section takes into account what's going on in the reference stream, right? And we wanna do that because we want, we use the reference stream to, to take into account any changes in light or discharge or any other variables that might happen, um, you know, coincidentally after warming. So everything I'm going to show you is from the experimental stream, but all the statistics takes into account what's going on in the reference stream. Um, so if we take that into account, we warm the stream by about 3.6 degrees Celsius, so close to what we expect uh, for the future, but for 21. So here's, here's our stream before warming, right? You've got, you've got cobbles. If you look closely, you see a little bit of filament algae and some slime on the rocks, but, but not much. So 3.6 degrees Celsius later, that's what we get. So this is, this is same time, this is an enormous, just a big mat of uh, green algae, uh, pulva. It's just essentially a model creature. Uh, really staggering, but this is, this is basically what you see in July or June, late June. <coughs> this is a time series of, of biomass, and so this is all the phytoplankton, or paraphyton, sorry, in green, and all the are these ribbons. So you can see all of around before warming, but it really takes off after warming, and it really dominates the community in uh, June and July, and then it's, then it's gone, or it's not as important in August. So big shift in sort of a macroscopic uh, perspective on this community. But we're interested in GPP, so this shows growth time production <clears throat> versus time. And so the green line is model GPP and the, the gray dots are actual measurements. And then the, the dark, the gray things in the background, that's light. So you can see after warming, as soon as the lights come on essentially, you have this big spike and a peak in growth time production, and then another spike in growth time production during that all the bloom. And so there was a significant increase in gross power production. But what we're really interested in is, can we predict the, because we expected an increase, but can we predict it um, using metabolic theory? So this is gross power production before, and we predict a 20% increase with 3.6 degrees of warming, and instead we saw 113%. So not 2,000, but it's also not in the same ballpark. So you look at this and you're like, okay, well, I just told you the story about end fixation. That's what, what's going on here. We're seeing an increase in end fixation. We don't have end fixation measurements in the stream. 
But we've looked in these in these communities, and we we definitely don't see end fixtures there during the first bloom. And there's only a small number of end fixtures present during the whole bloom. So so it looks likely, and I've calculated the amount of nitrogen you would need, the end fixation you would need to sort of make sense of that, and it's just too high. It doesn't seem like expectation is driving that increase. And so what is? Well, part of it, part of it's light. <laughs> so this is uh, PAR, photosynthetic active radiation, before warming and after warming. Turned out that the year after warming was brighter. Um, but, uh, but that doesn't matter because we take that into account, right, because that's happening in the reference. But it might explain some of our increase uh, following warming. So we're going to check that out. This shows light adjusted gross fire production. So just gross fire production divided by light. And you can see <clears throat> that there's an increase in GPP following warming, um, even after you adjust for the amount of light. So they're using light more efficiently. And then even if we correct for that, so this is before the predicted 20% increase, even correcting for the light, you see a 90% a increase in so, so light isn't explaining all of this, but maybe some of it. Okay, well, so maybe they're not fixing N. They're using light a little bit more efficiently, but that doesn't explain all of our well. Maybe they're getting more nitrogen from the water. So let's look at our NF take. Measurement. So this shows nitrogen uptake over time. <coughs> um, blue is before, red is after. There's absolutely no significant difference between years in nitrogen uptake. Right? And every way you slice this, there's just no difference in nitrogen uptake. <laughs> um, so, so what this tells us is that, is that at the ecosystem level, right, there's not more end fixation, there's not more end uptake. That means that they're using the phytoplankton or the paraphyton are using nitrogen more efficiently. So this is nitrogen use efficiency uh, over time. Blue is before warming, red is after. And there's a big increase in nitrogen use. And that's calculated as net autotroph production over DIN uptake. So we see this big increase in, in nitrogen use efficiency, right? So what this is saying is that after warming, the community used nitrogen more efficiently. Wow. And so if you're like me, you're wondering what happened to the plot and why they're using it more efficiently. And so what this shows is these blue <laughs> Squares, these purple squares are, uh, are nitrogen, are sort of ecosystem level measures of nitrogen use efficiency. And the green are measures of phyto, or paraphyton C to N. And you can see, so C to N tracks nitrogen use efficiency here during the alba bloom, but not here. So it suggests that um, during the alba bloom, um, an increase in the use, nitrogen use efficiency of the algae themselves is is driving this increase of, in ecosystem level use efficiency. But at the but here during this bloom, something else is likely going on. It's maybe an increased mineralization or some other problem. There are no end pictures in those communities then. So what does this say about metabolic theory? Well, it said, you know, we saw that warming increased resource use efficiency and that led to more production than we thought. And um, so that means that and not only do we have to include metabolic theory and species traits or, and resources, but we also need to consider how species traits are changing with warming, so changes in resources. Right, so now let's, let's move to the landscape scale and see what this tells us about uh, on our model and how it holds up. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we have temperature acclimated streams. And we did a survey of these streams. We, we surveyed them um, quarterly, but I'm just going to talk about the summer data right now. So what did we see? This shows growth power production versus inverse temperature again. And so here the activation energy or the temperature dependency, the slope, is, is close to what you would predict, depending on, uh, on whose model you, you use. We're, down, now, we're now in the range where people are quibbling about that model. And, and it doesn't matter that much. So, so basically, it's close to what we would expect. Okay, well, why is, why is that? You got more of a, when you warmed a whole stream. Is there no nitrogen fixation? Okay. So if you go around, you see tons of nitrogen fixtures. So these are all not stock. 
That's a big grain of nostoc there. Um, I mean, that thing's like this. That's anabena. So there's nostoc and cyanobacteria everywhere. And Jill Walter, our local uh, cyanobacteria enthusiast, I mean, was is thrilled about this, right? And she's gone around and she's measured end fixation rate across temperature for a number of different taxa. So there, at the landscape scale as at the microcosm scale, that increases with temperature. Um, and if you scale this all the way up, it's messy, but it sort of conforms to theoretical predictions. So this is the natural log of nitrogen fixation versus inverse temperature. And there's a lot of noise, but at the ecosystem level, we're seeing nitrogen fixation responding exactly like we expect. So, so what's happening here? Why, why isn't that elevating uh, production? And the answer is we, we don't really know, right? So if we go back to our model, we see that end fixation is increasing like we expected, but, but the uh, or end fixation is increasing like we expect. GPP is increasing like theory predicts, but the effect of end fixation on GPP is muted. And so it says that, okay, well, we can use this first principled approach, but, but for some reason that all of our work at other scales tells us, well, the mechanisms are all wrong. Something, something is going on that's, that's sort of disconnecting what's happening with the end fixers from how that's influencing the growth rate. And so, so here I'd just like to take the last, the last five minutes to, to sort of try to combine all of these scales and tell us and, and see what sort of like kind of 30,000 foot picture we can, we can produce from, um, from these, these different experiments and this the trade off between complexity and control and duration of warming. So I'm going to create this matrix of plots. We have our microcosm, here are our channels, here are our whole stream warming experiments, here are our, our landscape survey, and then we're going to do GPP and fixation and DIN uptake. And so for GPP, this is just a review. We saw in the channels way more, a, a much stronger temperature dependency than we expected due to end fixation. At, at the whole stream scale, we saw more, a stronger temperature dependency than we expected, but not, nothing near the scale as what we saw in the microcosm. And then when we get to the landscape level, we see basically what we predicted. <laughs> so something's happening across these scales that's dampening that, that uh, temperature dependency. Um, and fixation, we basically see, we see the same temperature dependency that theory predicts at, uh, in the microcosm. There's very little evidence. We didn't measure end fixation, but there aren't even a lot of end fixtures in this whole stream warming stream. And at the landscape level, although there's a lot of noise, which is to be expected at the ecosystem level, we basically see the temperature dependency we, we predicted. And so also I'm going to add DIN uptake in here because this is important for under, helping us understand how nitrogen is coupled with GPT. So here <coughs> in the channels, we basically, we see Nitrogen uptake decreasing, having a, not, decrease, not increasing as rapidly with temperature as we would predict, and that's because nitrogen fixation is basically supplying that nitrogen. We're seeing no change in, ni in nitrogen uptake in the warming experiment, and no change, although the data is noisy again, in nitrogen uptake across with temperature at the whole system level. So, so just to summarize, um, in the channels, we saw an elevated activation energy, so the temperature dependency, due to an increase in nutrient use, ecosystem nutrient use efficiency, driven by increased nitrogen fixation. In the warming experiment, we also saw an increase in stronger de temperature dependency of uh, GPP, again driven by an increase in nutrient use efficiency at the ecosystem level that was really driven by an increase in how the autotroph community used resources. And in the landscape survey, survey we saw um, basically the temperature dependency we expected. And that's surprising in spite of an increase in end fixation. And so we're really, we're not quite sure what's going on there yet, but, but there's a possibility for feedbacks within the food web or also for acclimation as, as these, these species uh, as the community shifts and as they, they acclimate to the changes in temperature. 
So what does this say, I'd just like to conclude, what does this say about how warming and our ability to predict it? Well, what we're seeing is we're seeing differences in responses to warming and in the mechanisms driving those responses across these scales. And, and our work is really confirming <coughs> or uh, whatever, confirming terrestrial warming experiments that, that are showing that short-term responses to warming that we see here and here <coughs> can be very different than long-term responses to warming. Um, and that's, that cr creates a problem for our ability to basically predict what's going to happen to, to ecosystems as, as we warm them up. And so, so just to conclude, I think, you know, this work sort of suggests that as, as you scale up, you really need to consider not just these first principle theories, but also how warming indirectly influences species in the community and their traits, the level of resources and how they cycle within the community, as well as the feedback and interactions. And really importantly, the duration of warming, right? So we don't expect the things could, if you warm up a little plot today, <clears throat> the responses you see warming it over the summer are not going to be the same responses if you warm it for a decade or for 100 years. And so that, that makes it really potentially complicated, but also challenging. And since I have a couple more minutes, I'd just like to talk about our future directions. So um, now we're, we've just started this project. Um, this is the second round of this, and we're looking at how temperature interacts with, with nitrogen and pump. So, you know, a ma another major driver of global change is nutrient increases in nutrient loading and eutrophication. And so we're, we're really interested in understanding how temperature and these nutrients interact. You, you know, we've studied the effects of nitrogen and phosphorus on, on aquatic e organisms for, you know, for 50 years. We understand a lot about that, obviously not everything, but what we really don't know is, is are those responses going to be the same as we warm up these ecosystems as they were in the past? So, so we've been adding uh, nitrogen and phosphorus to, the, to these rivers across spanning a temperature gradient, and we've also uh, conducted these uh, we're conducting more microcosm experiments where we're uh, combining temperature treatments with nitrogen treatments, uh, phosphorus treatments, and then nitrogen and phosphorus treatments. And so that's, this is just some preliminary data. You can see this is temperature from last summer versus nitrogen. And you can see big shifts in the community, right? <clears throat> As you warm them, you get more nostoc, and then you get an entirely different community at high nitrogen. And what we're seeing is, so this is biomass, so net prime production versus inverse temperature. In the cold, down here in red, unfortunately, <clears throat> in the coldest treatments, you see this really elevated temperature dependency. But as we, as we add nitrogen, you, you see the same temperature dependency that you that theory would predict. So this is saying that, that we're not going to see the same, that, that the responses to warming are really going to be contingent on resource level in, in these systems. With that, I'll, I'll just stop and I'll take any questions. Yeah. Uh, Mike, um, that, that addition experiment, the landscape level at the end, do you have any data that, that suggests that there is different levels of nitrogen and phosphorus coming in at different areas, like is there a, I don't know, a sheep farm or something that, that might explain something? Uh, the differences among the streams? Yeah. Uh, okay, so the question is, are there, there sort of spatial heterogeneity and NT supply that might explain some of the differences? Um, I don't think so. These are, these are very <coughs> small streams. I mean, they're, you know, they're this wide. Our reaches are... 30 to 60 meters, and that's the majority of the watershed. Oh, wow. So, so we have a handle on what's going on. So there, you're right. There are sheep moving around this landscape. And no, they're no. pooping. Yeah. <laughs> but, but they're all over the place, and I think that's pretty equally distributed. Yeah. So the, the whole stream warming was the second experiment you're talking about. Are there plans to replicate that? I know it's a big undertaking to do that, but it's the one stream. So I, I'd be curious to see is that the same kind of scenario you might see if you pop from, if you did another one of those streams. So, yeah, so the question is, would we see the same thing uh, if we <coughs> repeated this? Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, there are no plans to replicate that, <laughs> unless Ohio State grants wants to <laughs> money to do that. Um, no, so we uh, we are very lucky to do this. We, one of the reasons this worked was that we had a cold stream right next to a warm stream, and so we didn't have to move that water very far, and it's we are able to penetrate the deep here. And so uh, doing that with a similar setup somewhere else. You know, it's a really interesting question, and one I would, you know, at the base of that, the question is, if you did this somewhere else, would you see the same thing? And, and I'm not sure. And I think one of the things we got, one of the things we learned from that one experiment is, is how, you know, the difference, when you warm a system, how things change, right? So we just, we just went out there and we cranked it up by 3.6 degrees Celsius, more or less, and, and all of a sudden things started to change in that and it shifted, you know, and it, it, the, the macroinvertebrates, the algae in those communities, they all started changing. Some went out, some did better. And so I think a lot of the stuff we saw in those first couple of years were just related to, like, who was in that community and who was driving them out. You know, we would see different responses after those days. And that's kind of the reason why, because yeah. you, you see these experiments that are in the literature where you introduce different <laughs> zooplankton in the same barrel, but you introduce them at different times, and it's just when they're introduced or what density each one's introduced at, the resulting community can change very differently. And so I thought, if you moved it to another site, would you still see the same, you know, filamentous that, that came in there, or would it completely change on you? Um, you had two years of data for that one. I know you only showed one yeah, there. Yeah, and so the filamentous, all of it just takes off even more. Even just that increases by 800%. I noticed in, uh, in your diagram the gross production continued to rise in all your experiments. Where would you have to raise the temperature to trigger the that crest to begin to drop? That's a really good. So, so the question is, right? I have this linear log linear relationship between gross product production and temperature. Where would it plateau and go down? And it's at. I just had a colleague. I think it's, it's somewhere between 45. The optima for gross product production at the ecosystem level is somewhere around 45 or 50. Very high. The reason I ask is that geologically, you look at where in the geologic record you perhaps have this optimal temperature. It apparently was a matter of like some of the work. I couldn't be wrong. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, that's neat. Yeah. Can you remind me why the. Uh, why the metabolic response of gross product production production is different or is it's a lower it's a lower response rate by the temperature, is that correct? Why well, I forget why that is. Do you, do you know? <laughs> I feel like I've heard that's that. Like a question. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> well, it's a totally different process. Right. Yeah. And and it's the reason I there's a lot of debate about it. Right. So um, you know theoretically be linked to the rise of the temperature, right? And the temperature dependency of that. But, uh, you know, what's the limit of the No. Or what? <laughs> the organelle? Or, I'm not sure. Or what? Anyway. Uh, oh, God, it's blank. This is totally embarrassing. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of, there, there's so many different processes involved in photosynthesis, and it's so different from cells to plants. And so all the theory is actually based based on plants. And, and there's some theory that says that it should actually be a touch higher than for, for um, So it's, it's, it's not a very good answer. I'm sorry. No, that's like, I don't know the answer either. I, I couldn't remember. I thought I, I, thought I heard it one time, but yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It, it comes from this model that comes different temperature dependencies and sort of emerge. 
So, so in the warming experiment, you see these, these incredible shifts in the macro. There's no fish in the warming experiment, but uh, the macroinvertebrate community shifts dramatically, right? So, so all of a sudden, like black flies that were emerging in the fall, all of a sudden they're they're emerging in you know June and the spring. So there's a big shift in phenology. There's a huge shift in in species composition as well. I don't know. It's not clear to us what fraction of that those changes are driven by changes in production versus changes in temperature. We haven't been able to sort of parse those things. Yeah. So in that Canada experiment, have you done anything to restore the stream back to its original shape when you have impacts on the stream? Okay. So the, qu the question was, did we do anything to restore the stream after the experiment to its original condition? And so we, well, the story is we, we try to keep this going. Right, so you know, all of our results were saying that um, you know, short-term responses are different than long-term responses. So we were trying to keep it going, especially in between funding cycles. And uh, eventually, like this big pile of snow came and fell on the heat exchanger, and destroyed it, bent the pipes, and everything. So that happened in the winter, and we got there, and uh, we just we couldn't fix it. We actually used the tubing for the channel experiments this summer, but. But the stream was the stream is not normal. It like it so so these streams, I mean they get covered in snow, they get they get huge floods, uh, you know, ten times a year or something like that. So so they're wiped out and that and okay. there's probably some snail carcasses which invade it, but but I don't think I don't Think about it. Many of the spring thaws that you have, I mean, those streams are just abused during the time of the year, and they recover from it pretty darn quickly. Any other questions?
So what we run into are some zoos that do a good job of raising money to support ongoing projects in foreign countries, but that's not really conservation. That's a little bit more philanthropy than anything. So we're interested in doing actual conservation ourselves, and we've been doing a lot more of that in recent years. And a lot of the species that we have in captivity in these exotic species are great ambassadors for a lot of the same conservation issues. We just often don't notice it. So elephants. Elephants are a pretty good example. There's all kinds of issues related to human-wildlife conflict in elephants, and it's very easy for us to uh, point the finger at you know, what should be done or how those should be handled in the situations uh, within Africa where, where elephants occur. But we often don't make the same tangent or the same connection with some of the human-wildlife conflicts we have here. I mean, Ottawa Hills has an issue with deer going on. We just had a biker eaten by a bear the other day in Glacier National Park. I mean, we have a lot of those same uh, wildlife conflicts going on. They're just not quite at the same level. Uh, we often interpret things like rainforest and habitat loss, and a lot of our own, you know, uh, local residents don't realize we have one of the most globally rare ecosystems in our backyard that goes through a lot of the same fragmentation and the same uh, successional issues and habitat loss. So, uh, what we've been doing in recent years, uh -oh. is a user error issue. Well, Kevin, he's always the error. <laughs> It was user issue, but I appreciate you taking the heat for that. <laughs> so what we've been doing a lot lately in the last few years is a program that we branded as, as Wild Toledo. And basically, this is an umbrella for much of our local conservation efforts. These local conservation efforts have a lot of ties more now than they did historically with things like the zoo's development department, uh, you know, our PR department, our marketing department, and our education department. So there's, it's, it's really fertile ground for us interpreting a lot of the, the, the issues that are going on in, in conservation in general in people's backyards. So some, I just want to run through some of our more major initiatives within this umbrella. We've been doing a lot with urban prairies, um, native plantings both on grounds and some of our partners out in the community. We have some species focused initiatives. Uh, we do quite a bit with on-ground communities of predators, things like raccoons and skunks and possums. We do quite a bit with hellbenders, head starting hellbenders. We've had a long history of doing butterfly work. I'm going to dwell on a lot of this stuff you know, a little bit more in depth as we move in. Uh, in recent years, we've been doing quite a bit with monarchs. And a lot with turtles over the years. We have some species-specific things that we've been doing, some general herb surveys of the refuges. We've gotten into some native orchid work in recent years. And we have a decent trail camera uh, biodiversity mammal monitoring effort. And then every time I turn around, there's new things we're working on. Uh, we've been working with mosquito control through various sanitary methods. We're looking at for native options rather than the gambusia for some mosquito control efforts. We do some bat monitoring. Another one that I should add on there, and I haven't, that slide's a little bit faded. We're turning into some surgeon project. Uh, and it looks like that's going to come to fruition in this next year. So it literally is one of those situations every time I turn around, we've got more things going on in our backyard. Uh, I want to mention right off the bat that we now have a pretty decent website. Uh, the zoo's uh, website in general. A little lackluster, but we have a conservation dedicated website along with our Wild Toledo as one of the initiatives under there. And you can get a lot more information about the current state of some of these projects that I'm just going to gloss over uh, from there. So, urban prairies are one of the things that we've been doing a lot with. And this is a great opportunity for us to really, I, I should mention, the mission side of the zoo, our mission is inspiring others to join us in caring for animals and conserving the natural world. This is really that interface where we can start to get people to appreciate some of these issues that are going on. So our urban prairies, uh, it's no question, we've seen a lot of this in the popular media. Uh, people are starting to realize that our pollinators are not doing well. Uh, last year, we got into monarchs, realizing that our monarchs are not doing well. Uh, monarchs serve as a great ambassador for some of these issues, but obviously we all realize the issues around pollinator loss and what that's going to mean for our uh, food consumption. Uh, last year, we got quite a bit of uh, you know, federal attention with the presidential edicts. Um, and in a lot of these circumstances, these losses are truly mysterious. We don't know what's really going on, but sometimes it's kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> sometimes it's just like a lot of the other attacks that we're discussing, there's habitat loss. And in our situation, in an urban, uh, suburban environment, this is a great opportunity for education about habitat and habitat creation to benefit things like pollinators. I heard a statistic the other day that over 50-some percent of the United States is agricultural. There's 40-some percent in this urban-suburban matrix. That's a lot of property that's tied up as lawn or mowed areas. Um, and even when landowners are trying to do a little bit better and they're planting some ornamentals and not doing just lawn, they're also collecting ornamentals that are not providing 
providing the benefit to our ecosystem function or to the pollinators because they're usually uh, Asian or European or something along those lines and they don't form uh, the food sources, either the host plants or the nectar sources for most of our pollinators or the, uh, or the uh, butterflies or anything along those lines. There's a couple of great uh, folks if you're interested in this subject. Bringing Nature Home was one of the first and then recently there was another one all about backyard landscaping with native plants, the benefits of that, and even species selection and, and things along those lines. But as we all know, there's a great tie with this with Lake Erie. Now we get a lot of press from the agricultural runoff, but this is really common in an urban environment where you have backyard lawns with all of the, the lawn runoff entering into a dish. You have, uh, in this image taken near my house, a, a railroad track. But a lot of the situations we're getting into creating these urban prairies are actually pre-contaminated soils. So you have the added benefit. Yeah, it's not agricultural runoff that's necessarily flowing into Lake Erie ultimately and causing the algal blooms, but in some of these situations, there's a lot more toxic things that are doing exactly the same thing and still ending up in our watershed. So, you know, a lot of the same uh, reasons and rationale apply in these urban environments too. And this is just a pretty egregious example of some of the, what we've done to our landscape and this ditch is, you know, directly communicating to the Maumee River. So what we started doing in 2013 was converting some of our own property to urban prairies. Uh, that's the Toledo Zoo, uh, the green space there, that large polygon, the red one is a solar array that we don't own, but we're the sole purchaser of power from. And because of that, we asked them to put all native plantings around that. Uh, we've since expanded into the community. We've got an acre in Ottawa Hills that we're doing. And a project that I was really interested in that PNC funded is we now have naturalized areas at three Toledo Head Starts, and we're going to integrate the native plantings into some of the preschool education, getting kids out into those plantings, uh, doing some very basic maintenance of preschool, so flipping rocks and catching isopods and things like that, hopefully exposing kids to a very early age. This is, this is urban Toledo. These are, these are children that may never really make it out frequently into a natural area. So we've now moved into that. Uh, these numbers are Dated. We have an installation at Owens, Illinois corporate headquarters. We have an installation at Penta. Uh, we're all over the city now, and we're up to about uh, 31 acres total that we're managing as part of this program. Uh, we've reached a point where there's not much more property on grounds that we can do. Uh, we're installing 32 uh, custom seed mix, 32 species. In some of these larger situations, we hire a contractor to true access those seeds in. Uh, in some situations, it's been a great opportunity for an educational component. This is Wildwood Academy, where we actually had the students broadcast seeds themselves. Uh, in some circumstances, we've actually moved into growing a lot of these plants in our concentration greenhouse, uh, and we can get them to a very, a, a decent size very early in the season, and essentially give our prairies about a six-month head start and plant on plugs. The problem with this is it's tremendously labor-intensive. Uh, you know, this is Mayfair Elementary where we put about 2,000 plugs out there and then we oversee the plants. The benefit to this is nobody, it seems nobody has patience in an urban environment for a prairie to mature like it needs to. So this really gives us the ability to get it some color initially and ultimately make these urban transformations a little bit more successful. So why are we doing this? Well, it's probably pretty obvious to you guys. Uh, as I mentioned, it's providing habitat. It's reducing maintenance. So one of the situations we did was the Anthony Lane Trail median right in proximity to the zoo, and that's a situation where they no longer needed to mow that as frequently as they were. There were two guys apparently that were tasked with mowing the Anthony, Tra Anthony Wayne Trail median. They would start on one end and mow all the way to Maumee, and then turn around, and that was their almost their entire summer. So if they can just make two passes along the perimeter to keep it looking nice, that saves quite a bit of uh, time. Obviously not only time, but fossil fuels and uh, maintenance on the mowers and everything. Uh, you guys are aware of this, I'm sure, but it manages rainwater much better. That's why uh, lawns going up right to a, a, a ditch is not good. These plantings have incredibly deep roots, and they can absorb a tremendous amount of water, orders of magnitude greater than a, a lawn or a residential uh, weed situation. I argue they're aesthetically pleasing. Uh, last fall, I think I have that slide coming up, we ran into some issues where that was, uh, that was called into question. Uh, for some of our partners, the fact that they sequester carbon is a benefit. Um, not necessarily for all of us, but all of these together really allow us to tailor fit whatever the benefits are to whatever partner we're talking about. So when we reached out to Owens, Illinois, uh, as soon as we started mentioning the monarchs, they were very excited about it. When we talked to the city of Toledo or Toledo Public Schools, when we talked 
talk about the reduction in maintenance. There's a two acre parcel that we took over management of from Toledo Public Schools. It was an old elementary school site. They estimated it was costing them $5,000 a year just to maintain it. So obviously when the Toledo Zoo approaches and says, can we plant a bunch of pretty weeds so we don't have to mow it anymore, that's, that's a big benefit for them. Our benefit is more mission-based and we can achieve all of the other ones. In all of these installations, especially the ones on the grounds, we've been doing monitoring along with them to demonstrate that it's actually achieving what we want. Obviously, we're doing vegetation monitoring to actually demonstrate that there is an increase in the biodiversity and the vegetation level. We've been monitoring the reptiles and amphibians. There's a couple of cases at the zoo where it's really interesting. We had cover objects for sampling reptiles and amphibians on the perimeter, and within a matter of a couple of weeks, they immediately started, when we would catch snakes underneath them, the cover objects out in the center of some of those installations would take about two years, but we're not in circumstance. We're walking around these lots that were previously mowed lawn. We'll find butlers, garter snakes, and five line skinks just running around. So it's, you know, it's, it's a clear illustration of the fact that these are, from that perspective, uh, beneficial on this increase in the biodiversity of those locations. Butterflies and bumblebees are something that we've been monitoring in both of these circumstances. We've seen an increase in the species and an increase in the abundance of those species. So it's, it's just kind of a slam dunk. We started running some Sherman traps at all of these locations. We hoped to demonstrate a shift in the mammal composition or an increase in the mammal composition. Uh, we did not entirely see that, although it's still a little bit out as a metric. We were just using uh, effort, unit effort in the form of trap hours. But how this turned out to be extremely beneficial is it's shocking how many people are convinced that our native plants are the reason their rats are showing up in their yard. So, being able to have the data that demonstrates the fact that, no, we did not see an increase in rats. And this doesn't shock you guys. Rats didn't co-evolve with the plants that we planted. Rats are a, a, an, an invasive species that we brought over here. And they're dwelling in human dwellings. They're not feeding on the milkweed or the uh, you know, coriolis that we planted. Those, those plants have all evolved mechanisms to prevent herbivory. So it, it's, it's not shocking. But if we had not taken that data, we wouldn't have the ability to say that unequivocally. Now, of our benefit from the mission side is we can use all of these for educational opportunities. So the ones that are at the zoo, we frequently have our uh, summer camps out there monitoring butterflies with us. Uh, we use our zoo teams to collect a lot of seeds in the fall. This ultimately, the seed collection ultimately makes it a little bit more sustainable for us, but they're definitely getting an education while they're doing that. Um, so there's a lot of these opportunities. And um, we're educating beyond just our own staff. These are examples of the issues we had in the fall uh, over the Anthony Wayne Trail meeting. And what was interesting is it was during a mayoral election, so it became a major issue. And we were trying to stay out of it to some degree because we had a levy coming up, and it's not our property, it's the city's property. We just entered into a partnership to develop it as native planting. But what was interesting is, as much as potentially negative PR we were getting related to this, this was one of the first times that I can remember that we actually had conservation benefit uh, educational opportunity that was really in the forefront of the local media. So this, this really offered us a great opportunity to educate um, residents, uh, municipal, whatever the case would be about this kind of land transformation. We tried it all along the way to do what we can with education and signage. These were some of our earlier signs. There was a 50 mile an hour sign on the left and there was a pedestrian sign on the right. And we got a lot of a little bit of flack that we weren't doing as good of a job of um, you know, delineating why we were doing this or what these were for. So we started coming up with something just a little bit more simplistic. We have four iterations of the sign that simply says things like saving monarchs, saving resources, saving Lake Erie. So we're getting it across, hopefully, at uh, even a 50 mile an hour situation. But I think it's one of these circumstances where you just literally can't educate everybody. You're going to still have still going to have some opponents to it. And in the case of the media, there was not a lot of people that were opposed to it. And if you're interested in this kind of thing, you should check out those late articles and look at the comments uh, after the Because <laughs> <laughs> those, were, those were very entertaining and very telling. So this was, this was one of the locations uh, uh, a year and a couple months after installation. I think it's hard to argue that your lawn or the weedy patch prior to this is more aesthetically pleasing than this. And we have a couple other examples that came from this year, installations that we just did last year that are really they're really kind of impressive. This is behind our employee parking lot. Um, and so to go in an area where it was previously just lawn and now see all the, the pollinators and, and in this case sometimes 
sometimes garter snakes. I, I walked behind a service this complex the other day, and a mother's garter snake was coiled about that high up in one of the quarry ops. It was kind of entertaining because it was just long before that. That's the Anthony Wayne Trail median. I can see why they were opposed to it. I mean, right? <laughs> So uh, another thing we've had a long history of doing conservation lines are butterflies. And this is another great example of a shift in, in our paradigm, I think. We've had a great long history of doing work with carnivore blue butterflies. Uh, we have captively reproduced animals collected in Allegan, Michigan, and brought them to oak openings for a release. They have actually remained. There still is one population remaining that reproduces on its own. Uh, Dr. Ryan Walsh, one of our employees, was doing a vegetation uh, model habitat, and from that, we've actually kind of ironed out some of the Ohio habitat requirements for carnivores a little bit finer scale than I think we did historically, and now we're entering into this program again, doing some more captive rearing, and hopefully some more target releases. And we've had another great history being Mitchell Sager's butterflies. Both of these are federally uh, endangered butterfly species. We have a greenhouse full of Mitchell Sagers right now. We've ironed out a lot of the husbandry. They were collected out of Michigan, and they're going to be released at an Indiana Fen site. This is a great thing that we can interpret because in this case, the stem site was lost through concession. Nature Conservancy has done a great job of managing it, and it now is suitable again for Mitchell Cleaters. Our role in this is just the captive husbandry. Our role in the corner is more of the actual habitat analysis along with the captive husbandry. But why this is kind of a paradigm shift is this is what we do and have done for many years, um, but we're moving into monarchs more. And monarchs certainly are a conservation issue, but monarchs have turned out to be a tremendous ambassador for this kind of land transformation and uh, habitat creation and things along those lines. These two imperiled butterflies certainly aren't a bad situation, but you're very hard pressed to go find a Mitchell Saders or a Carner Blue. But monarchs are in people's backyards, and monarchs are what people do care more about and actually have a, a, some kind of association with. So the monarchs have been a great program for us to talk about lepidopsins in general and talk about some of these things. And, and it truly is a conservation benefit because a lot of people ended up putting milkweed in their backyard as a result of some of these things. Just stop the working. Oh, there we go. So this is our monarch greenhouse. We grew 1,500 Asclepias swamp milkweed for just rearing some monarchs. We collected 11 in the early uh, first flight and reproduced them through three generations in the greenhouse. And we released a bunch of them in the fall tagged. Um, people really got behind the project. It was a great opportunity for us to get kids involved. Everybody loves preschoolers releasing monarchs. They, they care about <laughs> milkweed in their backyard. I mean, it's just a slam dunk. Uh, and we have some resources at the zoo that some of these other partners don't necessarily have. We realized Monarch Watch didn't actually have a video that explained how to tag their monarchs using their Monarch Watch tag. So it was very easy for us to get our video guys to create a video. Uh, Monarch was just, Watch was all excited about it, and it's, it's, you know, it's gotten our initiative and our name out while benefiting Monarch Watch in general and benefiting the, the Monarch program in general. We released 180 some monarchs for the flight at the end of the season last year, and 10 of them were actually recovered in Mexico. Uh, turtles are another thing that we've had a long history of doing. Um, and this is a situation where zoos are kind of uniquely poised to do this kind of work because turtles, the two species that we focus most on have been spotted turtles and, and more predominantly Blaney's turtles over the years. Um, but Blaney's turtles, and I'm not going to dwell on this because you guys are probably aware of this as, as, you know, as much as anybody, but Blaney's turtles have very unique life history traits. Um, extreme longevity, there was just a recovered one of SRE, uh, Georgia Reserve, Ann Arbor, Justin Coggin marked it 50 years ago, and it was 23 years old when they marked it. This is an 83-year-old animal that was recovered. Uh, so I actually need to change that first bullet point because prior to that there was a 77-year-old animal. So you're talking a turtle living in your, essentially your backyard in Ohio that can live 100 years. It takes 20 years to reach such maturity. It reproduces probably every other year, and the vast majority of its eggs are slaughtered by raccoons and that's okay because it's co-evolved that long, extreme longevity because of that. But we're in a situation where habitat fragmentation, again, a lot of these themes that are throughout conservation and people can think about and care about when we talk about the exotics but don't necessarily translate that to their backyards. A lot of these things are going on. Habitat fragmentation, uh, harvest in some circumstances, road mortality, and increase in subsidized predators are all causing these animals, both spotted, blanding, and in some cases boxes, to really 
really be pushed beyond beyond um, you know a sustainable population. Most of the populations, two of the population, two of the three populations we've looked at, there is no evidence of recruitment. They are generally characterized by low recruitment, anyways. So we've been doing these, but why a zoo is pretty well suited to do this is that if you're going to study an animal that lives a hundred years, you're not going to get this done in a master's program. You're not going to get this done in a PhD. This is a long-term monitoring effort. Um, and it's an effort that needs to be undertaken to identify some of these uh, life history parameters for these populations. So these are the three locations that we've been studying dating back to 2005. And what's interesting is because of who we are and the fact that we can continue just to mark turtles year after year after year, we've got a tremendous amount of interesting data. We just recaptured a painted turtle that had been marked 12 years prior. And it's pretty incredible. Uh, I guess it's 11 years prior, whatever the case may be. But that, those kinds of growth intervals are not real common in the literature because most of those species are generally regarded as common. Now, our motivation for undertaking this marker capture effort is for enumerating the number of Blanius turtles and looking at the Blanius turtle population health. But it gives us a great opportunity to collect a, a suite of additional um, characteristics on a bunch of other species. The other thing it allows us is a great opportunity to interpret this, not only with our volunteer force, but we're in a situation now where we have a summer camp that we take out, and these kids are getting exposed to trapping turtles in the Lake Erie marshes. They're going out and they're doing radius telemetry, another thing that we're employing currently for box turtles. Uh, and they're getting a basic understanding of marker capture and some very basic uh, you know, standard backbone science methodology. So it's a great opportunity, and then we are able to interpret it in our graphics at the zoo. We get a million visitors a year. That's a lot of people, even if half of those, even if a quarter of those people see any of this through our publications, our email blasts, whatever the case may be, it, there, there is, you know, there is some decent education, conservation education taking place. That's one of our summer camps, again, exposure to trapping and radius telemetry. Some of these kids never had an opportunity to, to handle a turtle up close. Everybody enjoyed it. Maybe not that kid on the right. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, I just, you know, just saw Tuesday and Wednesday, Wednesday trapping uh, turtles with another group of kids. And it's, it's a good, good, uh, good experience. We've been okay. able to employ some other methodology to these populations that, again, we're not quite as concerned with sample size. We're not necessarily immediately interested in publishing this, but we can use some of these technologies for identifying critical habitat and things like that that are a benefit to our partners like the Toledo Area Metric Arts or Nature Conservancy. So these turtles are all wearing GPS units, and this is something we've done many times over the course. That turtle on the left is actually out at Huge One Wildlife Refuge right now, still wearing that GPS unit. These are GPS logging units, so they're kind of like those I buttons we discussed before. Uh, you have to get your turtle back and plug it into the computer to know where it was. <laughs> but once you do, you didn't have to go out in the mosquito-infested uh, oak savanna habitat to track your blindness turtle. You can just plug it in and see where it's been. In some circumstances, this has been just a wealth of information. In other circumstances, it's been a colossal failure, uh, and it just kind of depends. But that's you know that's like trapping crayfish. We discovered this earlier today, right? You can't predict it. Um, but what we can do with this is we can really start to look at some critical habitat parameters at specific locations. This is a circumstance where we had one turtle at this location. We actually had three. This is data from one turtle. Uh, and over the course of the two years, which are shaded in two different colors of green, uh, we can tell that this is a this is a situation where we trapped the pond, which is that larger, obvious body of water there. We assumed the blinding turtles were using that pond. And from the spatial data that that animal had in its GPS unit that it was carrying around for the six months it had it, it actually turned out it wasn't in the pond all that much. It was using the habitat around it. Well, this is the Toledo Area Metro Park site where they had possession of largely at that point just the pond, not the flooded forest that surrounded it. Mm -hmm. So they've since acquired a lot of that land, but what's interesting is in both years, the animal went to this little stretch. I don't have a lighter colored dot because it's it actually died, but I recovered it in February, so I know it was there. In both years, it went back to this little stretch and ditch. This is a great example of fragmentation and critical habitat. No matter what the Metro Parks does for preservation and management of that land, if those turtles are using that ditch and an entity comes through and digs that ditch out during a critical uh, time of year when those animals are overwintering there, which is what they did the two years in a row, that could be catastrophic for that population. What was interesting is at that pond location, we marked a total of 10 turtles. That was it. When I was trying to recover 
discover those two GPS animals in that dish, I found two other animals that I had marked out of that pond. So out of the total of 10 animals we parked out of that pond, four were recovered in this tiny little stretch of this nasty, degraded Lucas County dish that were overwintering there. So it's completely plausible, given their life history taste that we talked about before, that that could create, that could be extremely, you know, critical habitat for their long-term survival. So it's those kinds of things that zoos are, are, are pretty well situated for, for doing long-term. Another program that we've been really involved in lately are hellbenders, and this is kind of analogous to the butterflies and kind of what we may potentially be doing with the sturgeon. All, all our role is, is the head starting. Hellbenders, everybody know what hellbender is? I don't know, a lot of heads on. They're North America's largest salamander. They're like crazy cool. Uh, at any rate, so this is their distribution in Ohio, the red. The green are the watersheds that are they are currently known from. Uh, an individual, Ralph Finkston, did work years ago and actually comparing Ralph's early work and Ralph Finkston and Greg Lips' current work, what's interesting is even where they are extant, it appears that they have an 80% reduction in the population and many of these populations, depending on the watershed, appear to have no evidence of recruitment. Well, hellbenders generally are regarded as a long-lived salamander species, so they're approaching more like the turtle example I, I, I you know, mentioned earlier. So it could very well be, like the turtles, that you have streams where the adults are just maintaining but there's no real recruitment. So a viable option, at least as a band-aid, was demonstrated by Missouri, and they've done a tremendous job with this, head starting these animals and putting them in the streams. They persist. They eventually grow and reproduce. The ultimate cause of why there isn't recruitment isn't necessarily determined, but it is more of a stocking situation. So this is what we've been participating in, Division of Wildlife for us, we'll participate in collecting the eggs from these healthy streams where they do periodically reproduce. Those eggs are brought into a captive situation at the zoo, and we rear them. This is where you're all supposed to go, aww, this is an adorable little baby hellbender that just hatched. At any rate, the problem with rearing hellbenders is at a small life stage, when they've just recently metamorphed or, or recently hatched prior to metamorph, excuse me, you can really keep them at reasonably high densities. This is a 40-gallon tank. We're approaching, you know, 200, well, we got 259 animals in there. That's fine. It's a load of hellbenders in there. They do fine at that circumstance, but they reach a point where, because of their growth and their territorial nature, we have to distribute them. This is a seven-month-old hellbender. This is getting an idea of how fast these things are growing. It's about at that stage that we need to really reduce their densities. But optimally, uh, Division of Wildlife would like us to keep them for nearly three years before they're released. At a almost two-year period, they can uh, we can give them a microchip, a passive integrated transponder, so that they're at least identified permanently. So it needs to be at least there, but there's this cost-benefit where, you know, at the recently hatched size, literally everything eats them. You're talking they're like popcorn for crayfish. As opposed to the three-year stage, these things are like the lions of the streams, and they're, you know, they're much less vulnerable to predation. The difficulty is we don't, it takes a while for us to get them to that period. So this is just a, uh, the growth of Toledo zoo animals with the x-axis being years and, and the length of these animals. Um, and this is a, a graphic explaining the relative cost benefit for the amount of water necessary to rear them. It really catastrophically goes up. So if we keep them to that three year period, they're taking a lot more time, a lot more space. So volume of water in the space is a limiting factor for our ability to rear hellbenders and the other partners. I should mention Columbus Zoo also does this, but we are we have the lion's share of hellbenders for this Ohio project at Toledo and our partners. Um, so the limiting factor is actually space more than anything. We maintain ours initially in a biosecure room that's about 10 by 12, and in this room we can have about 600 hellbenders of varying uh, size classes up to that three-year point, which obviously there's much fewer of those. But with space being a limiting factor and with a lot of zoos wanting to do this but claiming they don't have space, we approached Division of Wildlife about an idea to develop a modular facility at the zoo to demonstrate that you could do it in a modular facility. So you get your modular facility, which is a bus to bus trailer. <laughs> and you get Toledo School for the Arts, again, demonstrating some of these great partnerships that the zoo has kind of make your trailer look a little bit cooler, and you can pack it full of hellbenders. And now we have a price tag associated with us, we have a care associated with us, and now Division Wildlife can demonstrate to the additional partners 
then yeah, you can do this. All you really need is, is the location and you could do a modular situation. Uh, through this, we actually developed what might be even a cooler project. We now have Penta Career Center, which is an animal care school <coughs> in it, rearing hellbenders as part of this partnership. So we moved from the Toledo Zoo 200 hellbenders that these high school students are taking care of. So prior to that, they were learning animal husbandry um, and, and things like that from more of a pet shop animal, for lack of a better description, but now these high school students are able to apply those same uh, learning experiences with a state endangered salamander that will ultimately be released back into the wild. So it's, it's kind of a win-win, and it's a win-win for the partnership because we get greater space, uh, and it's a win-win for Penta because they get to do a little bit, hopefully something a little bit more rewarding. Um, so we're in a situation now where Toledo Zoo is affiliated through Penta and the trailer and our rescue and we're raising a ton of hellbender. Another program that we've been doing quite a bit with lately uh, are trail cameras. And this graphic's not even current at this point. We have about 70 trail cameras spread out through the Oak Oak Games uh, in the Green Ribbon Corridor, which is a corridor created through Nature Conservancy, Metro Parks, Division of Natural Areas and Preserves. They've really connected a lot of this natural space. And partially as a result, there are more and more um, sightings of badger in Lucas County. We had our first bobcat a couple years ago that was up by C4. Central Avenue by Seaport Metro Park. So part of this, there's no question, part of this is more, more of those cryptic mammals that are difficult to find. But what we've gotten out of this is just a really interesting general uh, biodiversity assessment. Uh, foxes are a great example. We know red foxes are all through Lucas County. Uh, Division of Wildlife has some concerns about gray foxes. We have locations where gray foxes show up. There's St. Patrick with red foxes at some of those locations. But we have other locations where there's just gray foxes and not red foxes. So. Uh, that's one example of the kinds of things that we're getting out of this. We also have a set of trail cameras up in Allegan, again, another oak savanna habitat uh, where the car and blue is originally uh, collected from for this location. So we're doing a little bit of a comparison between those. Um, and this is another great thing for interpretation. So we've got you know the project going on, but this is a great opportunity for us to talk to our members, our visitors, the general public about the kind of wildlife that is living essentially in their backyard in Lucas County. Um, and it's amazing, a lot of the, the people that we are presenting these images with, they don't, they don't realize that they've got coyotes still in their backyard in downtown Toledo or you know, Red Fox or Gray Fox. So it has, it has provided us with even more opportunities. That's not to dismiss the international effort. Uh, we still do uh, a lot of what I mentioned before. We support some of our other projects. But we have staff members that are doing efforts at an inter international level. We're pretty involved in the Marianas and the Faunal Conservation Initiative. Uh, that snake, which pains me to say, kind of a cool snake, the brown tree snake, uh, in the Marianas Islands has invaded some of the islands and has really been, been a problem. It's, it's like it has in Guam. It just eats all of the bird species. Well, several zoos have formed this MAC, as they call it, to uh, kind of save the extinction of some of these animals by moving them to some of the other Marianas Islands that are not infected, for lack of a better description, with a brown tree snake. And we have staff members that participate in this, in this a couple of times a year. So that's a great program. Uh, Tasmanian Devils. So this is an interesting shift in the way that we have historically done things. So there's the Safe Tasmanian Devil Program. I don't know if you guys are aware, but there's a facial tumor disease that Tasmanian Devils are struggling with. Well, a lot of zoos are certainly providing quality funds for that project to continue. Uh, we actually took it a step further and we asked, how can we get a staff member there? So we currently have an adjunct uh, staff member that we're paying the entire salary for to maintain uh, some of the surveillance of the facial tumor disease in, in Tasmanian Devil. So it was a situation where you know we could support a lot of different projects or we can kind of go all in and, and this is how we wanted to do that. So we have more of a stake in that devil program than, than we had historically, and we actually have a staff member doing a lot of the work. Uh, we have had a long history of doing Peruvian boa work, and this is something that we're going to continue. Uh, both Cuban boas, Virgin Island boas, uh, some of those were along the lines of kind of like classic zoo conservation. Rodents were an issue on some of these islands. Uh, the Puerto Rican government and the Virgin Islands, the U.S. Virgin Islands, went in and rodenticided some of these islands. And then Dr. Peter Tolson, who's on the upper right, um, went in and actually we reproduced these animals in a captive situation and reestablished these populations after the pollutants were removed from the islands. 
that's a program that will continue. Pete does great work with general quality natural history um, assessments of human boas because of his contacts with the military base. Um, so he goes down there frequently to do that. Well, Rubble Island Rattlesnakes is another program that we've had a long history of and we continue to do uh, surveys with the Rubble Island Rattlesnakes and uh, deal with and educate related to some of these uh, human wildlife conflicts that are a result of having a predominantly touristy island that has a endemic and unique rattlesnake. Um, so we still do have a lot of the international efforts, but as you can imagine, you can't really take a bunch of uh, kids to Cuba uh, and educate them about conservation issues and be very helpful. But you can take them to, you know, rural Lucas County and talk about a lot of different 